section. This is going to be the section on the respiratory system. And we're going to do some fairly simple nuts and bolt, bolts things today. We're going to talk about the structure and function of the respiratory system. And we'll begin here with a, a simple list of a few of the things that the respiratory system does for us. And of course, when we think about respiration, the first idea we come to is the idea of gas exchange. As we're sitting here breathing in and breathing out, that's all respiration. But what we're trying to do is bring oxygen from the outside world down deep into the lung at a site where we can now exchange that oxygen, bring the oxygen from the air, and bind it to the hemoglobin and erythrocytes. The other side of that gas exchange is that the carbon dioxide, which has been generated as a waste product from oxidative phosphorylation of the tissues, is going to be brought back to the lung. And again, in the lung, the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the blood across the endothelium of the pulmonary capillary, across the epithelium of the alveolus, and back into the air. And then as we breathe in and out, mix these molecules, we'll bring more oxygen into the alveolar space and get rid of more carbon dioxide. But there's another thing that carbon dioxide does for us. The carbon dioxide plays a really important role in regulating blood pH. It is the major buffer in the blood. And for our respiratory system to function properly and for our blood system to function properly, we need to have the blood pH maintained in a fairly narrow range between about 7.2 to 7.4, more or less neutral. And the major player in maintaining the blood pH within that narrow range is, in fact, bicarbonate. But the source of the bicarbonate is carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is the waste product of oxidative phosphorylation when the, uh, when the oxygen molecule accepts a mole uh, an electron, it forms water, and the carbon, carbon dioxide becomes a byproduct of oxidative phosphorylation. That gives rise, that, but we can t then combine carbon dioxide with water to give rise to a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. The hydrogen ion is largely absorbed by the hemoglobin and the bicarbonate ion then floats free in the blood. And this provides a, a robust sort of buffering system. Now, most of you have had some chemistry or recognize that bicarbonate is a terrible buffer in the range of 7.2 to 7.4. Um, its pK, I think, is down around 4, 4.5. But we have so much of the bicarbonate around that we can, in fact, utilize the bicarbonate because of its high concentrations, and we can use it to buffer in the 7.2 to 7.4 range. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the buffering system. We'll spend most of our time today talking about the anatomy and, to some extent, the physiology of the respiratory system. When we talk about the anatomy, we'll break it down into a major series of tubes, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and finally down to the alveoli. Now, we're going to summarize this today to say that the larynx, the trachea, the bronchioles, and bronchioli, oh, I'm sorry, the bronchi and bronchioles are in fact all part of the conducting zone. You can think about them fundamentally as a series of tubes whose function it is to deliver air to the business end of the respiratory system, which will be the alveoli. Now, I'll show you some slides that, that will put the lie to this a little bit, in that some of these terminal bronchioles, and some, and just before we reach the alveoli, some of those are considered to be as part of gas exchange. If you put your phone away, I'd appreciate it. And this gas exchange now, though, is going to occur down at the end of this conducting system. So in broad strokes, we're now going to divide the respiratory system into these two great regions, the conducting zone. And you can think about the conducting zone as a series of tubes for air delivery. And in the first pass of this, you can think about these as more or less rigid PVC tubes. But we'll find that in biology that there's more control of those. And that we're now going to have some level of control of the diameter of these tubes delivering air down to the respiratory zone. The respiratory zone is the business end of this thing. The respiratory zone is composed of an epithelium, of an epithelium uh, in the alveolus, right next door to an endothelium of the pulmonary capillary beds. And we'll draw this and emphasize that this is the site of gas exchange across this exquisitely thin layer of epithelial cells, across an exquisitely thin layer of endothelial cells, and into the blood.
We'll draw this out and then we'll come back to this idea of regulating the diameter of the tubes in the conducting zone. So one of the things we're going to find is the bronchioles particularly are surrounded by straps of smooth muscle. And we can then activate the smooth muscle and either constrict the smooth muscle and decrease the diameter and radii of these tubes, or we can relax the smooth muscle and increase the diameter and radii of these tubes. And we'll talk a little bit about the physiology of that. But let's first just make a list talking about the function of the respiratory system. And its first function, for, of course, is gas exchange. And we'll find that oxygen moves by diffusion. From oxygen moves by diffusion from air into blood specifically hemoglobin. And the second major event here down at the respiratory epithelium is going to be carbon dioxide moves by diffusion from blood into air in the alveolar space. The second major function is buffering by bicarbonate. And the bicarbonate arises from simply the effects of carbon dioxide and water. And if we look at the chemistry of this, carbon dioxide plus water gives rise to H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. And the carbonic acid dissociates into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion, HCO3 negative. We're going to see in the lung and also in the erythrocytes that this reaction is sped up like a million fold by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. But it's nonetheless, for our purposes here, the bicarbonate is going to play an important role in buffering the, buffering the, the pH of blood. And it maintains the blood pH. in the range of about 7.2 to 7.4. 7.4 is getting a little basic, a little alkalotic. And we'll see a little later that this becomes important because as we get more and more acidic, we have a tendency for the hemoglobin to give up oxygen. That's something called the Bohr effect. And as we get more and more basic, the hemoglobin tends to hold on to the oxygen more tightly. And we'll walk our way through that. So any questions to there? So then what we're going to do now is look at a little bit about the anatomy. So we'll take this panel and talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system. And we'll start up here. It's a little bit like a funnel. This is the larynx. This is what we call the voice box. And it turns out that in the voice box, there are these flaps of tissue, which we call the vocal folds. And when we speak, what we're doing is we're using and controlling the movement of air through the larynx and regulating the vibration of those vocal folds. 
there are those among us who can find a particular note and exactly hit that note by vibrating these vocal folds. I can't hope to do that. But there are some people who, who have trained themselves to hit just the right note and can change those notes very quickly by regulating the movement of air and causing the vibration of the folds using that air in the larynx. Then coming from the larynx, coming out of the larynx, is this structure called the trachea. One of the characteristics of the trachea is these regular structures of hyaline cartilage. The hyaline cartilage rings provide a kind of support. And we'll see as we walk our way through this that the way we breathe in and out, the way we breathe in is we generate a partial vacuum inside our lung. And that generates a differential in pressure. When you have a differential in pressure, you now have a flow. And so air is going to come in through the, through the larynx and down into the trachea, and we'll see it goes down into the lungs. But if we didn't have some rigid support of these trachea, when we would inhale, we'd actually generate enough of a vacuum that this would, the air pressure would lead to some collapse of the trachea. So we reinforce this tube with the hyaline cartilage rings. The trachea is a single tube, which then branches into these two structures called the bronchi. Each one of these is a bronchus, the two taken together are the bronchi. But then the bronchi themselves rapidly begin to branch. And officially, you see secondary, tertiary, and quaternary branches. But what I just want to emphasize is the idea that there is this tremendous amount of branching of all of these tubes. And after a few branches, we now get into these smaller structures, which we call bronchioles. And if we follow these fine branches all the way out, we find the terminal branches end in a structure down here I'm going to show in blue called the alveolus. The red dotted line here is meant to represent the outside of the lung. So this would be the left lung. And over here, of course, would be the right lung. And as before, these tubes branch and branch and branch. And all of these tubes up to this point are said to be the conducting. Zone. And the conducting zone is fundamentally tubes to deliver air to and from the alveolar space. Much of this branching, the, 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 the function of much of this branching is simply to increase the surface area. So let me show you a couple of slides of this. This first slide is just a pretty picture of what I just drew in the board. And it summarizes the same material, and we can walk through it, in that there's the larynx with the vocal folds leading into the trachea, then the trachea branch and the bronchi, and then these bronchi further branch and branch into the 
all the way down to secondary and tertiary branches, finally ending in these bronchioles. The right side over here is meant to show what happens after the bronchioles, and we get down into the alveolus, in this so-called alveolar duct, leading the air from the bronchioles down into the alveolar space. The next slide is intended to give you some sense of how much branching is going on and how much increase in surface area we see from starting with a single tube down into the depths of the lung. And you'll notice we start out here with a single tube of the trachea, and then we break into two for the bronchi, and then we go through these secondary and tertiary branches until finally we get down to the terminal bronchioles, and we have 60,000 of them. And then we go through another round of branches, and here we have 500,000 of these respiratory bronchioles. By the time we get down to the terminal alveolar sacs, we're up around 8 million. So there's a tremendous increase in numbers, and that leads to a tremendous increase in surface area. And typically, when you read about this, you'll, you'll recognize that they'll tell you that the overall surface area of the alveolar sacs, where gas exchange is occurring, that the overall surface there, there is something in terms of half a tennis court. It's an enormous amount of area. And we need that area because it's across this epithelium of the alveolar sac, where all of the oxygen is going to come out of the air and go into the blood, and where all the carbon dioxide is going to leave the blood and go into the air. And that's down at this region. Now, the truth of the matter is, there's probably a gas exchange all the way down here in the respiratory bronchioles, where we have about 500,000 of them. But I want to emphasize these terminal alveolar sacs, where we get most of the, much of the exchange. The next picture is just a, a kind of diagram, or oh, it's actually a, a representation of the alveoli. And if you look at the alveoli, they look like a bunch of grapes. But each one of the alveoli, each one of these sort of spherical structures, is a single layer of epithelial cells. And the single layer of epithelial cells forming the alveolus will sit right adjacent to the endothelium of these pulmonary capillaries. And if you follow the blood back, you'll recognize that there's deoxygenated blood coming in to the pulmonary capillaries from the right side of the heart. That's deoxygenated blood. And after that, ox that blood passes over the epithelium and takes up oxygen, it's then returned to the lung through the pulmonary veins. And so we're taking that oxygenated blood back to the heart. But this is where the gas exchange occurs. And you can begin to see by having all of these bunches of grapes at the ends of the bronchioles, that we'll get this tremendous surface area increase across which we can get gas exchange. What we're going to do now is we're going to work our way back up into the bronchioles. And I want to talk a little bit about the conducting zone and how we can use these straps of smooth muscle to regulate the diameter of the bronchioles and thereby regulate the movement of air through that conducting zone. So in the upper panel, what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these bronchioles and enlarge it so that we can describe bronchiolar structure. So I'll just draw these two parallel lines to represent the walls of the bronchiole. But remember, wherever we go in this system, we're going to see a continuous layer of epithelial cells. So all along the structure will be these epithelial cells. And if we would do this on the upper panel, we could follow those epithelial cells of the alveolus into the terminal bronchioles, up into the bronchi, all the way out to the trachea, the larynx, and out into your pharynx. So this is a continuous layer. of epithelial cells. These are, in fact, epithelial cells of the conducting zone. These are just like the epithelia we've run into over and over again, where the epithelial cells are sitting on a basal lamina. 
So the epithelial cells have their basilar surfaces attached to the basal lamina, and the apical surface is facing the inside of the tube. Now, along with those epithelia, now and again, on occasion, there will be one of these purple cells. It, too, sits on a basal lamina. So it, too, has an orientation with an apical surface. But this purple cell now is a mast cell. And now, snaking around the bronchioles will be the strap-like structures of smooth muscle. And you'll remember, of course, that smooth muscle is one of the targets for autonomic nervous system. We'll find here that the autonomic nervous system will innervate this through the parasympathetic branch. And the neurotransmitter released by the postganglionic neuro of the parasympathetic branch will be acetylcholine. Know that by tonight. The other branch here, though, is the sympathetic branch. And the sympathetic branch now is going to not be innervating. It's, we're actually going to work through epinephrine released from the adrenal medulla. Nonetheless, these will be G-protein coupled receptors that respond to epinephrine, and we'll come back to that. So now you can imagine, if we go back up to this upper panel, that we're breathing the air in, it's coming down through the trachea, going into the bronchi, coming down through the bronchi bronchioles, all the way down to the alveolus. So when we breathe in and breathe out, we're moving air through this conducting zone. We're bringing air by the conducting zone. Now, over here on the right-hand pa panel of the upper, I'm sorry, the right-hand side of the upper panel, I want to now think about what's going on with the mast cells. And these mast cells, I'm going to talk about these mast cells in, in terms of a pathology. In fact, this is probably in a, in a more regulated fashion that's less extreme going on all the time. But what I want to talk about is something that many of you are aware of, which is the response of the mast cells to produce an asthmatic attack. And we'll see that any of you who've ever had an asthmatic incident know that it's really difficult because you're having a hard time breathing in and breathing out. And we'll see here in a moment that that all revolves around changing the diameter of these bronchioles. So what do I want to do? is imagine that we have this epithelial cell layer that we described on the left. Sitting on a basal lamina, giving you the orientation where this is basilar, and that's apical. And then this is the structure of the mast cell. You'll remember that the mast cell secretes histamine. Well, there's a detail here I want to add to what we talked about in the section on the immune system. When we talked about antibodies generated by B lymphocytes, we were talking about an antibody called an immunoglobin G, IgG. But there are a whole family of different antibodies. There are IgDs, IgEs, IgAs. And this particular one I want to tell you about today is a transmembrane protein in these mast cells. 
it has a particular type of antibody. It's called an IgE, E standing for epithelium. And you find these underneath your, uh, in your skin. You find them all along your respiratory tract. Now, what happens with these antibodies is in some cases, they're made to some allergen. It could be pollen. It could be grass pollen. It could be pollen from trees. But one of the ones that's most extreme, and I'll use this as an example, is a peanut allergen. This is usually a lectin. It's part protein, part sugar. What happens when the peanut lectin binds to this antibody is that it now mobilizes through a whole series of second messenger mediated pathways. It mobilizes vesicles containing histamine. So if we work our way back through this, we'll see that these mast cells are on their basal lateral side releasing histamine. And if in the middle here we imagine a smooth muscle cell, this is intended to represent a smooth muscle cell. On this smooth muscle cell will be a G protein coupled receptor. This is a GPCR that binds histamine. When the histamine released by the mast cells binds to this G protein coupled receptor, it leads through a series of events, through adenyl cyclase and so forth. It leads to muscle contraction. This is where the question comes up that says, what you told us when you talked about inflammation and bacteria, that the histamine caused smooth muscle relaxation and increased blood flow. And that's true. But it also is a good illustration that the hormone or neurotransmitter is less important than the receptor to which it binds. So in this particular case, this is a G protein coupled receptor that when it binds histamine, causes muscle contraction. In the arterioles in the skin, the binding of histamine leads, rather than to contraction, leads to relaxation and increased blood flow. But if we now imagine what's going on here, if we extend this this brown smooth muscle cell to this strap-like structure of these muscle cells are all connected by gap junctions. We'll see then that on the smooth muscles where we have the G protein coupled receptors, the binding of the histamine is going to cause this muscle contraction. The, this muscle is wrapped in a strap-like fashion around the bronchioles. What's that going to do to the diameter of the bronchiole? It's going to decrease it. And when we breathe in and we breathe out, we, get, we generate a pressure differential. And remember, we generate a, prefer, a pressure differential, we generate a flow. And we formalized that when we said that flow equals equals delta P times pi rate times R to the fourth power by eight divided by eight nu L. Well, nu here's gonna be low, it's true, because it's air and not blood. But we can treat air just as though it's a fluid. And if you're an aerodynamic engineer, you treat fluid air as a fluid all the time. And so we can think of this as a fluid, and now we can think of the idea of Poisson's law and the relationship of the diameter of these tubes and flow through them. 
This told us for blood and tells us for air that flow is proportional to the radius raised to the fourth power. That means it doesn't take much in the way of contraction of these smooth muscles down these tiny bronchioles to close them off and increase the resistance to flow a whole lot. And that's what you feel when you have an asthmatic attack. You feel this difficulty in breathing because you have now reduced the diameter of these tiny bronchioles so that you've increased the resistance to the flow, and that's the flow is proportional to r to the fourth power. So for a given delta p, you're going to reduce the flow a whole lot. So what can we say about this, and how can we tie together this autonomic nervous system point of view to something therapeutic. So all of you know, any, of us, any number of us know someone who has recurrent bouts of an asthmatic attack. Sometimes it's not this intricate structure of the antibody. Sometimes it's exercise-induced asthma. But again, it's the same pattern. You breathe in and out fast. You breathe in and out cold air fast. And what you do there is you increase the local inflammation. And when you increase the local inflammation, that leads to the release of histamine. Once the histamine's out and about, it's the same story. It's going to cause the contraction of the smooth muscle and reduction of the diameter of these tubes. If you know someone who has recurrent asthma, you know that they'll carry with them these nebulizers. The nebulizers are really these clever little structures. Basically, you have a little tube, you bring it up to your mouth, and you, you pinch it, and that gives you a squirt of highly atomized, tiny little droplets of fluid inside that tube, and then you breathe it in. And so when you breathe it in, you're breathing in those molecules of atomized fluid. You breathe them, bring them in all the way down into the terminal bronchioles, down to the site. Now, the nebulizers contain, let's spell it out here, nebulizers, The nebulizer fluid normally contains cortisol and albuterol. The cortisol reduces inflammation. The albuterol binds to epinephrine. Receptors to activate them. That brings us back to the smooth muscle cell. In addition to those histamine receptors, there's another G protein coupled receptor out here. This G protein coupled receptor binds epinephrine. Epinephrine, I'm sorry, the, let me do it this way, albuterol is an analog of epinephrine. So now we breathe in the albuterol, the albuterol binds to the epinephrine receptor, activates the epinephrine receptor, and then through this GPCR, called a beta-2 receptor, through the beta-2 receptor, epinephrine causes smooth muscle relaxation. So from that, I think you can see why we use these nebulizers if we feel as though we're going to have an asthmatic incident. 
We use them in part because we're releasing histamine because of inflammation. So the cortisol reduces the inflammation. But more importantly, we're binding the albuterol to the G protein coupled receptor, which I showed in green here, of the epinephrine receptor to mimic epinephrine, epinephrine and cause muscle contraction. It's the same reason if you know someone who's especially allergic to someone, to something like peanuts, for example, they'll often carry with them an EpiPen. Epi stands for epinephrine. And what those pens are is they're mecha they are these pens where you poke yourself with the pen and immediately inject yourself with epinephrine. The epinephrine then binds to these beta-2 epinephrine receptors and causes the smooth muscle contract, I'm sorry, causes smooth muscle relaxation to open up the airways and allow air to come through. Yes? Is there any habituation with use of uh, either the epinephrine or yeah, The question here is, is there a habituation with the albuterol? Do you downregulate those receptors, for example, if you have a lot of albuterol? I don't know. I simply, I, I, it's, a, it's a very, very logical question. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if it were true. I just don't know that it is true. Um, you find any number of these G-protein coupled receptors have fairly exquisite regulatory systems on them. One of the G-protein coupled receptors that we know of that has a lot of, of regulatory system on it are the opiate receptors. These are enkephalin and endorphin receptors. And one of the issues with opiates is it takes more and more and more to get a response because you'll downregulate the production of them and, and bring more of them inside the cell. Whether that happens for the epinephrine receptor, I don't know. Someone knows. That's an important question. But I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me, but I don't know. Anything else? Now, I should say here, and we'll, we'll come back to this idea, but you'll notice in this process, I said, fine, epinephrine causes relaxation of smooth muscle, but we're also going to find that acetylcholine causes smooth muscle contraction. And this at first seems counterintuitive, but in fact, if you think about it for a moment, you'll recognize in the fight or flight and the rest and digest pathways, this makes a certain amount of sense that when you're under sympathetic drive you're elite and you're really frightened and you're trying to run away from something, then what you're doing is you're opening up those airways to reduce the resistance of air movement through the tubes. But when you're sitting at home relaxing, then what you can do is you can afford to constrict the smooth muscle. You don't want to cut these off entirely, but what you can do is you can reduce the overall volume of the conducting zone so that now you have a greater proportion of the volume of the lung dedicated to the alveolus and the respiratory zone where you're actually exchanging the oxygen. So basically what you do is you pay a price here a little bit, you basically reduce the overall volume so that the greater proportion of the overall surface area is now dedicated to the alveolus and the gas exchange. So any questions to there? Because next step is the gas exchange. So now what I want to think about, back up to the upper panel again, and imagine what's happening at the level of the alveolus. So that epithelial cell layer, which is a continuous layer to the outside world, along the bronchioles, extends down into the alveolus. So we'll take this right-hand portion of the panel and label this as the alveolus. As the respiratory zone. This is the site of gas exchange. Now, it's true that these alveolar sacs are going to be spherical, but I'm going to simplify it and make them more or less a box. But the ideas were pretty much the same. So this is meant to be an alveolus. 
These are the alveolar epithelial cells. The alveolar epithelial cells sit on a basal lamina, as always. That gives you an orientation to see that's the basal surface of those epithelial cells. But in here is going to be air. And there's a continuous open pathway from this alveolus up to the bronchioles to the outside world. So we're going to see later when we breathe in and out, we're bringing air down into the alveolus and expelling it back the other direction. But this air in the alveolus now is going to contain oxygen. Right next door to the alveolar epithelium is now a single layer of endothelial cells. This layer of endothelial cells is for forming the pulmonary capillary. These are tiny. They're no more than a couple of micrometers in diameter. Just enough room for individual erythrocytes to move by the alveolar space. So remember, it's the right side of the heart. It's the right ventricle which is providing the pressure to propel these erythrocytes through the pulmonary capillaries. And there's a continuous movement of these erythrocytes by the epithelial cells of the alveolus. The exposure time, the dwell time, of the erythrocytes here right next door to the alveolar epithelium, the duration of time that these epithelial cells are in contact, or the duration of time that these erythrocytes are within a short distance of the epithelium of the alveolus is in the neighborhood of about, oh, 0.75 seconds. When you're breathing hard, when you're exercising hard, when your heart rate's up around 180 or so, then you'll find that the dwell time here is in the neighborhood of about 0.25 to 0.3 seconds. And yet, even during these exquisitely short times of 300 milliseconds or so, there's enough time to fully load all of the hemoglobin molecules in these erythrocytes with oxygen. That tells us that there, has to be, there have to be exquisitely short diffusion distances here. That oxygen must freely diffuse across the epithelium, across the endothelium, and find its way here into the erythrocytes. This is a random walk. This is just oxygen going from region of higher concentration to region of lower concentration and binding to the hemoglobin inside these erythrocytes. If you take a measurement of the thickness of these epithelial cells, these epithelial cells are less than 0.1 micrometers thick. The thickness of the endothelial cells is similarly in terms of less than 0.1 micrometers. Even with the basal lamina and the extracellular space of the alveolar epithelial cells and the pulmonary capillary endothelial cells, this distance is not much more than 0 0.25, but 0 0.2 to 0.25 micrometers. The thickness of these erythrocytes, you'll remember, is less than 2 micrometers in their center. So what we have done here, this is all about, put your phone away to appreciate it, this is all about reducing the diffusion distances so that we have such diffusion distances that the oxygen can go from regions of higher concentration to lower concentration across these exquisitely thin barriers. Frankly, this freaks me out a lot. The idea that the distance between the blood in my lungs and the air in my air sacs is a fraction of a micrometer is kind of startling to me. And the fact that I don't bleed out through my alveoli all the time, I'm very grateful for. But this is a, it's no wonder that a shock 
can produce bleeding in the lungs because of these exquisitely delicate structures. But we need these delicate structures because we need the short diffusion pathways. And in fact, if you begin to get significant amounts of inflammation here that generates fluid, and you start filling this volume up with water, and you start increasing the diffusion pathways, so these diffusion pathways get longer and longer, then you're no longer able to adequately oxygenate the hemoglobin and the erythrocytes. And the increase in diffusion pathways produced by fluid buildup in the alveolar spaces is pneumonia. And the pneumonia kills us by simply providing a thick layer of water in here, and the diffusion distances are too great to get adequate oxygen diffusing into the, into the erythrocytes to oxygenate those hemoglobin molecules. So the function here then is to simply provide a very short diffusion pathway for oxygen to enter the, the blood. The rest of this now, so we can divide our world into the series of tubes that are delivering oxygen down here into the alveolar space. And it's in the alveolar space, in the enormous surface area of the alveolar space, where oxygen exchange and carbon dioxide exchange occurs. Because remember, the other player here is going to be carbon dioxide diffusing from the pulmonary capillary into the alveolar space. And as we breathe in and out, we bring fresh, fresh oxygen in and send carbon dioxide to the outside world. So any questions up to there? Yes? So you're more likely to get pneumonia subsequently? I don't have a good answer to that. Um, there are different forms of pneumonia. I mean, we commonly think of pneumonia as being caused by a pathogen. So it could be a bacterium. Uh, there's, I'm not going to remember the name of it, uh, it's pneumococcal bacteria. And, and that's one that commonly produces uh, pneumonia. And what happens is you get a proliferation of those pneumococci bacteria down in the lung. That proliferation, just as we saw the other day with getting bacteria into your dermis, will generate a typical kind of inflammation. You'll start getting fluid buildup. In that case, you sometimes get fluid buildup between the endothelium and the epithelium. But the function is still the same. You increase the diffusion distance. It doesn't matter whether you put this, the fluid here in the alveolar space or out here. You still increase the diffusion distance. And that becomes dangerous. Now, why you, you're more susceptible other times, I don't know, unless it has something to do with the inflammation response. And after the first round of inflammation, you're more likely upon secondary exposure to have another inflammatory response and, and, and build up the fluid. That would be my guess, but I don't know. So this is going to be kind of stupid, but the way that you describe fish breathing is pretty similar, just like a single layer of pool. So why can fish pull the oxygen out of water, but we can't? So the question here is about what's the difference between gills and lungs, largely. Fundamentally, a gill is the same arrangement. You're absolutely right. But there, they're moving water across a gill, whereas we're moving air down into the lung. And one of the reasons the fish can get by with this is they're, they're basically not warm-blooded. We simply need a lot more oxygen to maintain temperature. But the other reason is that those gills are finger-like projections. And so you can imagine if these these are the, the gill epithelium with the underlying um, endothelium of the blood vessels. They're moving, they're moving enormous amounts of water across that. And so if you get water down into your lungs, you just don't have a very good... So there, the viscosity becomes a real problem. You have a hard time moving the... the, 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 the have a hard time moving the water in and out. And the amount of oxygen in the water is less than we have in air. And so where this, we have some like 20%, we'll see a little later, it's more like 14% down here. But 14% of the gas molecules down here are oxygen. Whereas I don't know what the concentration is in water, but I don't think it's more than a couple percent. And, and, and so you, sim you simply have more oxygen air, which makes it easier for us. But also the viscosity allows us to move, allows us to move in and out. And then you have the other issue with the fish, that they're moving lots of water across. 
And so they, they can get by with it. Well, let's end it there, since we're at about 50 minutes, and we'll come back to the structure of the linings of all this tomorrow.